Um, one of the things being that in classical music, everything is obviously um, sort of set out for you compositionally, but in jazz, it's really all about improvisation. So um, I, I find it interesting that you are now uh, sort of an expert in educating other people on improv. Uh, so how, how did you end up learning that skill and then developing your own um, kind of lesson plan and, and how you teach improvisation? Well, um, really, I kind of look at it as an extension of what I was doing before. It is a switch, stylistically, but uh, it's also an extension. Improvisation is not a new thing. It was also done in classical music until fairly recently. In fact, I was just speaking with someone today who told me that in, in Bach's days, um, before someone got a job, they had to improvise in front of their patron. Wow. And a lot of the music, <laughs> yeah, I know, a, a lot of the music <laughs> of that time, uh, sometimes they would just have a figured bass. In, in other words, they were basically improvising over chord changes, mm -hmm. which is what people do in traditional jazz. So I think when you are coming to something uh, especially as an adult that you haven't done before, you can be a good teacher because you remember the steps by which you had to learn things as opposed to it coming very naturally. So uh, I, I don't really have lesson plans. The workshops are improvised as well. <laughs> and when I get together with the people, then what I'm going to be doing, you know, stuff with people and what's happening at that moment. There are certain things that I work with, but I, I a lot of times will just try to get people into a space where they feel comfortable improvising and expressing themselves and using whatever vocabulary they have on hand to express themselves. Right, because it's a very, um, it can be a very intimidating thing to suddenly now it's your time to solo and you have to basically create this entire um, melody and, and improvisation out of your head live in the moment and it can be sort of intimidating. So like you said, it, I, I'm sure a lot of it is getting people in the right mind state to be comfortable to be creative at that moment. Yeah, I and mean, even if they start with just one group, for instance, and play that note for the whole improvisation. <laughs> Put all their, all their feelings and emotions into that one note and change it. There are so many things you can do even in one note. Yeah. Well, it says, um, so you, you actually, you've te you teach workshops in improvisation. You've also worked with universities throughout the US, Europe, Canada. Australia, New Zealand, you, you've taught all over, and so this is really a part of who you are as a musician and as a music educator, and it said on your website um, when you're uh, talking about your workshop, the difference between composition and improvisation, and you as a composer as well, what to you is the difference between composition and improvisation? Um, I think that you, but both times, you have to be in a particular frame of mind, you have to be in a certain flow where ideas are coming to you. With improvisation, you have no safety net underneath. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it, and if it's not working, it's like, you know, falling off the trapeze, whatever. But. Um, with composition, in, in a way, you're improvising also, but you have a chance to go back and change things. It often starts, for many people, with me, certainly, with improvisation. When you are improvising, I think that um, you can think compositionally, so you're guiding the improvisation as you go along, in a way where you're being an instant composer. Right, exactly. That is that is really what's happening. You're 
you're still composing, it's just happening right then and there. Exactly. So this weekend you're going to be doing a solo performance on piano at the Newport Jazz Fest, but you have been um, a member of a number of different ensembles. For 10 years you were in the Anthony Braxton Quartet, um, playing and recording with them. What, uh, do you have a preference? Do you enjoy one over the other? Is it sort of you like both for different reasons? I like doing it all. I like doing it all. And I think I would be frustrated if I had to do only one <laughs> or the other. You know? I, I love playing solo because it's no holds barred. You know, you can do exactly what you want to do. On the other hand, it's all on you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one to hide behind, that's for sure. Um, so have you ever performed at the Newport Jazz Festival? No. This is your first time? And I'm very excited. Yeah, I am too. So it's actually very interesting. One of the reasons I was very excited to speak to you in particular is because I was looking at the lineup for this weekend and I would say that about 15 to 20 percent of all the performers this weekend are women. And out of that 15 to 20 percent of all the performers, I would say maybe half of them are instrumentalists as opposed to vocalists. So it's very interesting to me that female jazz instrumentalists are sort of underrepresented in a festival like this. Do you find that that's throughout all of the jazz industry? And, and why do you think that is? I, th I think it's very typical, although I have to say, when I first started out doing this, I was one of the only women doing it, particularly the kind of stuff I was doing. Mm -hmm. But now, I think there are many women on the scene, many, many, here in Europe and in all parts of the world. So I think that's been a significant change, uh, women instrumentalists. I, I think it's been traditional for women to be singers and maybe right. piano players. When I tell somebody I'm a jazz musician, they often say, oh, you're a singer? <laughs> right. Just assuming. Yeah. Uh, there, I know that there were all women bands in the early days, and I don't know the names of those bands, but I remember being in discussions where, where that was talked about. And I wish I could remember the name of this band, but that was already a long time ago, you know, way before I could see So people are around, and they're on the scene more. Uh, there And there have been women's jazz festivals, which I have mixed feelings about. In, in a way, it's good to be noticed that way, but on the other hand, it's like, kind of singling people out and saying, oh, look, isn't that cute? They can play too. There are two sides to that. So I've, I've always had mixed feelings about it. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I actually was a, a student at Berklee College of Music, which is a very heavily jazz-influenced school with many, many female musicians, instrumentalists there. and. Yet, here we are in 2017 with almost no female jazz musicians headlining any of the, you know, kind of, you know, it just seems like they're underrepresented and it. it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, did you find when you were maybe uh, getting into new bands that, uh, was there any resistance to the fact that you were a woman, or was it basically just if you can play the way we want you to play, you're in? I can honestly say uh, that was pretty much it, really. Um, particularly in the, well, people would call it avant-garde jazz scene. I don't really like that term either. <laughs> but it's not even really avant-garde anymore. Um, Really, people were pretty much accepted for who they were, and if you could play the music, you were in. Mm. So I, I never felt uh, any kind of prejudice against me for being a woman. Mostly, mostly never felt it. Although, I have wondered from time to time, 
with all the stuff I've done and my background and all the people I've played with, um, if I were a man, would I have been noticed more or gotten more offers to play on big time festivals and things like that? I wonder, but I don't know. And I, I feel lucky to be doing and to have done what I've done so far. I, I feel like I'm really blessed in that way. Absolutely. And not only are you going to be doing your solo performing this weekend at the Newport Jazz Festival, you know, which is a, a wonderful opportunity, great honor, I would say, for any performer this weekend to be a part of it, but you have had a lot of recognition throughout the years. Three-time winner of the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship Grant, Guggenheim Fellowship, many other awards and grants. How does that feel to know that you had that support and recognition from your community? It's, it's good. All of that support is good. And, and yet, in a way, it happened. It's in the past. And it's really about what's happening now, what's, what's happening going forward. So what is happening going forward? What else can we expect? Um, various projects uh, with different people. I'm going to Poland in October mm -hmm. to play with Barry Guy, who's a British bass player, play his music from our last trio recording. And uh, next February I'll be in Paris for a week with David Rothenberg, who's doing a project based on bird songs and Messian's music, so that's going to be fun. Wow. A possible residency in Iceland with some Norwegian musicians and <laughs> going to Italy. Lots of possibilities, so we'll see what happens. Very exciting. Well, this weekend, like I said, uh, you'll be performing on Sunday. What time and what stage can we find you? It's the Storyville mm -hmm. stage, and I believe it's 2.20. I hope I'm right about that. I think it is 220, but you can find it at newportjazz.org uh, to get more information. Um, so, Marian, uh, Marilyn, so sorry, Marilyn, you'll be performing this Sunday. Uh, thank you again for talking with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on the show.